Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here today with Ariel McManus, editor of Atlas and Alice. Um, so any questions, just go ahead and type them into the chat and I will work them into the conversation. Um, Ariel, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so tell us, Alice and Alice has been around since 2015, 2013? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, been around for about 10 years now. Um, and it's kind of, it's always kind of stayed kind of true to the original mission um, after 10 years. And it's nice seeing that it's been around for 10 years, you know, as so many literary magazines are opening and closing constantly. Yeah. It's nice to be part of a magazine that's kind of remained a little bit of a constant um, over time. Sure. Yeah. So tell us about its original mission, what its mission is now. Yeah. Yeah. I think the mission has really remained kind of sharing writing from emerging emerging writers. Um, so people, we definitely publish work by people who have never been published before, which is really exciting. will be like their first publishing credit. Um, and really looking for writing that's kind of exploring, we're all about intersections, so kind of like comparing two things that maybe people wouldn't necessarily think mm. to compare to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I notice uh, in the about, it's not just intersection, right? There's like a science component to it. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I saw, um, it sounds like the inspiration for the title has some sciency element. So I'll let you discuss that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of, that was the kind of initial inspiration. I wouldn't really call us um, sciencey, though, mm. at all. We don't really publish anything um, research based at all or anything like that. No academic writing, definitely. Um, we really are looking for the more kind of lyrical pieces. Mm. So tell us more about what it means for a work to have an intersection of ideas. Like what, can you give us examples and talk about like, yeah. Yeah, yeah we had, um, we've had a piece about, you know, I've read submissions that are like baseball and relationships with a father and kind of how baseball is a thing that like unites, you know, relationships between people um, we've had pieces submitted to us about um, trans identities. We just published a piece this week about trans identities and kind of comparing that to the life of a plant um, and kind of saying like, you know, how persistent you have to be in the face of adversity. So work like that, that's kind of comparing two things that you wouldn't hmm. maybe necessarily think. Yeah, that's interesting. So how does it differ from pieces that just use metaphors? Like a, a lot of stories just use metaphors <laughs> throughout. So yeah, yeah. think about like a piece that is actively juxtaposing elements versus a piece that just kind of, you know, uses lyrical language and metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think really the entire piece ends up revolving around that metaphor. Mm. And it becomes kind of like the central anchor to the piece is what we're looking for. But also I wouldn't say that we are only looking for words like that. We definitely publish things that do just employ metaphor or aren't necessarily about intersections at all. I'd say that's kind of, again, like the driving mission of the magazine, mm. but we are you know, open to other work. Sure. Um, so can you take us a little more into those pieces? Like, how did they, what was successful about them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's successful is, I think sometimes metaphor can feel so cliched mm -hmm. sometimes. And I think that's, you know, when we say we're about intersections, I think that invites um, a lot of submissions that do kind of go a little overboard, maybe with mm -hmm. it. So I think a successful piece is a piece where it is using that element of metaphor, um, but in a way that feels very, it's not, you know, trite at all. Like it feels very, it feels very real. Hmm. That's, a, can you tell us more like what, how would something, it's, just, it's so interesting, like on a craft level as a writer, as a fiction writer, writer I'm curious how, someone might go overboard with the metaphor. Like, I know what you're saying, right? Like it's too mm -hmm. heavy handed, mm -hmm. it's too, 
um, they're forcing it in some way or they're just making it too obvious. But can you mm -hmm. take us a little more into yeah, that? Yeah, totally. We get a lot of pieces that will want to explore kind of difficult familial relationships mm -hmm. or we get a lot of breakup pieces. And I would say with the familial relationships, we'll get a lot of pieces where they will compare the maternal or paternal figure to you know we've had like monsters and I think that that can feel a little bit too literal and we've had breakup stories where it'll be like a breakup juxtaposed with how someone broke a bone at the same time and I think that can feel too literal like when something is like literally both of them are breaking um and yeah like the father as monster I think we just get so much of that. Um, so I think it's also how unique does it feel? Do we get like a lot of those submissions or a lot of people using that same comparison? Because we're looking for things, again, that be a little bit different and aren't the obvious thing to compare things to. That's that's interesting. Um, so are, should the stories also have a narrative arc, right? Like they're not just image oriented or metaphor oriented mm -hmm. you're also looking for work that has like a character development beginning middle and end something like that yeah I would say so there are three editors um in nonfiction at the magazine and then we also have a reader and I would say that we all kind of look for something a little bit different I think I'm I'm open to pieces that don't really have that much of a narrative arc mm -hmm. I'm willing to you know read and publish things that are really exploratory um, maybe don't have like a very satisfying ending, a very like neat tie with a bow kind of ending. Mm -hmm. um, but other people at the magazine, you know, they have their own references and do want to see more of that arc. But the nice thing about the magazine editing for them, it's really everyone gets to champion pieces that they like. So even if one person loves it and maybe the other person didn't feel it was working well, like we'll still, everyone gets to pick and choose what they'll work on. Mm -hmm. Is the magazine all nonfiction? Uh, nonfiction, fiction, and poetry. Oh, okay. So um, that's interesting. So how do you distinguish between, because a lot of what you're saying, and I'm just getting like all these ideas <laughs> for pieces I might want to write, because it sounds really cool, yeah. but it also sounds very poetic. Like the way you're describing the fiction or the nonfiction sounds like poetry. So is there like a clear way that you distinguish among the genres? Do you just sort of leave it up to the writer to identify what genre they're working in? Yeah, that's a great question. I will leave it up to the writer to identify mm -hmm. that. And we have published a piece that was very poetic um, by Despi Boutrous. I'm not going to remember the title off the top of my head. Something about mortality was in the title. And that absolutely could have been published in the poetry section as well. Um, but it was sent to us as nonfiction. And, you know, I felt it worked as nonfiction as well. So we published it as nonfiction. Interesting. Um, so take us through your editorial process. What happens? Um, do you solicit work from writers or is it all through submittable? And what happens when a piece comes into you? Yeah, it's all through submittable. We don't um, solicit any writers. So it's all slush pile. I don't like that word, but <laughs> that's where it all comes from. And we are open twice a year for 300 submissions each time. Submissions are always free. And so we all, again, there's three editors and the reader. And so we make sure that three people have read everything so that there's always, there's never like a tie um, and that everything's kind of given a fair shot. And sometimes things are an immediate yes, you know, for me when I read them. And so I'll vote yes. Um, there are sometimes immediate no's, but I would say most things I try to read twice to give it a fair shot. Um, and I will always take notes in both times that I'm reading it on personally, just for myself. And then also I'll enter them into submittable. And sometimes that will start a conversation in submittable um, where the editors and the reader will all kind of discuss what we're thinking about it. Okay. Um, and we have a question here, is that 300 submissions per category and per, per reading period? So that is per reading period, and that's for the nonfiction category. I don't have visibility into what fiction and poetry, um, what their limits are, but theirs are different from ours. Okay. And do you work with writers on revision? 
Yes, we do. Um, I'm working with a writer right now. We actually just finalized it this morning, which is exciting. Um, yeah, I will try. We get a lot of pieces that are so close to being, they are final or very close to being final that I won't often accept writing that I feel needs a lot of work. But if I feel like it needs a lot of work, but I feel like it's, you know, I believe the writer could do it, then we will invite them to resubmit after they've worked on it. And I will provide, you know, very specific feedback of what I'm hoping to see change. And they're welcome to resubmit at any time. Um, they don't have to wait until the next submission round. They can just add it to their existing submission that we have on file with them. Um, but then once the piece is accepted, then we will, I will work with the writers. I try not to be too prescriptivist. I try to really like let the writer and their piece guide, you know, my process. I think when I first started, I was more prescriptivist and I was very strict kind of in my edits. And I've really kind of relaxed a little bit over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I really like to like to let them guide things. Mm -hmm. And I will, you know, if I suggest things and they don't want they don't agree, then, you know, I drop it. Okay. Um, so going back to the mission and sort of the overall vision of the magazine, I'm curious, Were uh, so were you part of the original founding team? I was not, no. I um, started three years ago. Oh, okay. And so do you, I don't know if you can speak to this, but do you know, like, was there a sense that um, there's too much of a similar kind of thing being published and we want to explore this cool aesthetic um, device in some way. I, I'm just curious like how that idea, because uh, I can see it leading to like all kinds of cool writing prompts. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I don't see other magazines taking this on as like the intersection of one thing and another. Um, and so I'm curious like what what inspired that idea? Yeah, I'm not sure if there was necessarily the belief that too many things were being published that felt very similar and that's how they wanted um, to kind of set up their mission. But I know that that, you know, is kind of how we feel now. We are looking for work that's really different. Um, sometimes we can tell, you know, if some if a magazine puts out a call and there is a prompt, mm -hmm. we can tell that we are receiving the piece that they submitted to that magazine when it didn't oh. get accepted like you know I am on Twitter and I see these calls too like right. I know you know if someone puts out a call like oh the beginning of the piece should start with this sentence then we get you know 20 submissions that start with that sentence and I'm like okay I understand yeah <laughs> I get what that's Just coming from. um but yeah I mean I wouldn't say that we are totally reinventing the wheel or anything yeah. like that. I think we are just looking for work that kind of challenges, um, you know, any previously upheld belief or the status quo, just in some small way. It doesn't need to be, you know, anything so huge. Um, you mentioned other magazines. Do you see Atlas and Alice as sort of a uh, sibling to other magazines that are out there? That's a great question. Yeah, I would say, you know, I would kind of put us in the wheelhouse of like a barrel house, kind of. I find us very similar to Passages North. Um, I think a lot of like the university magazines are doing some really interesting work and they seem like they're open to things that are a little bit, you know, experimental. And I would say that Atlas and Alice, you know, is like that. I don't think, you know, we're looking for these essays that feel like, oh, this was so clearly inspired by writing from the 1800s. Like we're not looking for this like really stuffy writing. We're definitely looking for things that feel really new and different. Yeah. But I don't know if I would call us similar to like, you know, there are some magazines out there that are really doing really forward thinking work. I wouldn't really say that we're similar to like a forever magazine or like a had or something like that. I think we're kind of different from that. Mm -hmm. um, and what kind of experience are you looking to have as a reader? Are you, because I've spoken to some editors, they want to be intellectually challenged, some want like an under the skin kind of, you know, punch in the gut experience. Um, are you open to all of it or are there particular experiences that you prefer to have? 
Interesting question. Yeah, I would definitely think punch to the gut is great. I would love to feel that. Um, I think I want to feel like whatever the writer is writing about is something that they've really sat with um, in mm -hmm. some way. It's something that they've really thought about and reckoned with and that they have kind of internally come to some sort of conclusion, even if the actual guiding narrative like hasn't concluded. Um, I think we just get a lot of writing where it feels like people are very in the middle of the experience mm -hmm. that they're writing about. And I don't think that those pieces end up feeling very finished. So I just want to see that someone has really like done the work of actually reckoning with the subject. Yeah, that was sort of my next question, which is like, what are common reasons for a work being rejected? So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, what does it mean? How do you know that something doesn't feel fully there? Mm -hmm. Again, we get so much like parental relationship stuff and breakup stories. And I think with the breakup stories, you can tell that the breakup happened two months ago <laughs> and it's very new and very fresh. And I think sometimes what makes that obvious to me is I think the writing can sometimes feel like it's trying to even the score a little bit. Mm -hmm. It almost becomes like a little bit like a revenge piece not that anything so awful is being written but it's just a way to kind of like get out all of the anger of maybe what happened in that relationship and I think really good nonfiction writing when we're writing about other people recognizes that in most situations like we do have some agency we are our own people and I think being a little bit of that seeing a little bit of the kind of both sides of mm. the argument, I think really helps me to see that they've reckoned with it a little bit more. Yeah, that's interesting. So it doesn't, you don't want it to read like a rant. You want it to sort of feel like it's been processed, yes. experienced. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so what do you think? So your magazine has been around for a very long time, you know, for the internet. <laughs> that's like eons in internet time. Yeah. Um, what what is it that keeps the magazine running? What do you what do you think is the secret to a successful online magazine? Totally, that's a great question. I think a really big thing about what I've loved about Atlas and Alice is that they understand, you know, in a lot of editor roles, it's volunteer work. Like none of us are getting paid. It really is a passion project, a labor of love. And I think Atlas and Alice you know, the editor in chief, they really understand that we, you know, are not being paid and we have these jobs and we are writers ourselves and they really make sure that we are not getting burnt out. So I think that that really, again, having caps on submissions, it helps us to keep submissions for free. And it also helps us to only take on the amount of work that we can truly give enough time to. Mm -hmm. Again, it allows me to like read everything twice. And I really feel like that helps make a difference and I can give things more of a fair shot and I can work with writers. You know, I'll go back and forth with people five, six times, you know, until we feel like a piece is really ready. And so I will only take on one or two pieces um, per issue. So mm -hmm. one or two pieces twice a year. And I feel like that really helps me to give the writing the fullest attention. And I think that that, you know, that ends up showing in the issues that we've really spent a lot of time with it, both the editor and the writer. Mm -hmm. And how many pieces per issue do you publish? We will usually publish somewhere anywhere between three and six. Oh, wow. Um, if within that 300, it, within nonfiction, three to six. And okay. then again, fiction and poetry will publish their own. Um, if within that 300, uh, submissions there were more than three to six pieces that we loved we will still accept them and then we'll push them into the next issue okay um and so what keeps you like excited I know we were talking earlier you're a you're a copywriter <laughs> by day yeah. and I'm curious like you know balancing all the work what keeps you what keeps you going yeah, again, it really is just like a labor of love. And I think when you find those pieces, you know, within the submissions that you really love, mm -hmm. um, you're always chasing kind of that high. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm working with someone, it's about um, 
Easter Island statues mm. and again comparing it to something that you would never think to compare it to I don't want to <laughs> spoil it since it's not out yet but it's it's a really interesting piece about feeling watched and mm. witnessed and like the pull between wanting to be witnessed and like not always wanting to be witnessed um and so every time you find a piece like that it's like oh, this is perfect you know this is this is really working this so I'm always looking for that next piece and the excitement, you know, of the possibility of that next piece is just so mm -hmm. thrilling. <laughs> um, and how do you promote your writers? I know uh, we've been talking, you know, I have conversations with other writers about this all the time. Like um, how do lit mags get read? How do you get readership people? You know, sometimes editors don't even really have much of a social media presence. Um, but I, I know you do because I found you on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. So what kind yeah. of efforts does a magazine go to to get read? Yeah, we will always publish at least twice to Twitter. We'll say, you know, this piece got published today. And then later that week, we will publish it one more, post it one more time just to, you know, make sure that it got its fair shot at being read. And then beyond that, I'll kind of follow the writer's lead a little bit. Sometimes when I accept a piece, the writer will immediately post to Twitter, you know, I just got a piece accepted by Atlas and Alice. Mm -hmm. And so I'll follow their lead. I'll retweet that. I might quote tweet that and say, like, we're really excited for this piece to come out because they're showing that they're really excited for it. So, you know, I want to be supportive of that. Um, if they're not posting about it, also, they'll probably post about it the day of. I'll, of course, mm -hmm. repost that. Day of, I will also be reposting it with a quote and I try to do that twice throughout that week as well um but again just kind of letting the writer decide like how much publicity do they seem to want for it yeah that's actually a question that I've had as a writer publishing work in a magazine like I I will promote it the day it's published you know and I'll announce it that day and maybe the next day but then I won't keep <laughs> like announcing, you know, there's that temptation because you want your work to be read. Um, but do you have any advice for writers, like how to, you know, should they tweet out their publication every single morning or like how do they get more readers onto their work? I definitely think that you can be like reusing the same piece and publishing it. I think if you want to be quote tweeting a published piece and using a different quote from it every time mm. and maybe doing it on the publication day, once later that week, once two weeks later, maybe a month later as well, getting like four tweets or Instagram posts out of it. I think that's totally appropriate. And as an editor, I'd be happy to retweet all of those. Even a year later, like I published a piece um, probably a year ago, Oysters by Amy R. Martin. And I remember she had retweeted it somewhat recently. And I was thrilled to see it. To me, it's exciting when the writer's excited to be in our magazine like yeah I like that so yeah I'm I mean happy to continue supporting years <laughs> after the business yeah. come out <laughs> sure um and we were talking a little bit before I started recording that you're a copywriter um for a large company <laughs> a large fashion company um how I'm really curious like how does the work that you do there differ from the literary work and it, I I would guess it, it's very refreshing to kind of turn off like the corporate jargon brain and enter into the literary world, but I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, definitely. I think copywriting, especially for such a large brand, there isn't a ton of flexibility to be super creative. Um, it is very kind of formulaic and very calculated. And so a lot of people will say, you know, if you want to be a writer, like a creative writer, you should never write during the day. Um, <laughs> so I did not take that advice. But <laughs> I think it still works because it's such different writing. Um, personally, I wake up, I wake up really early. I wake up at six every day and I get my creative writing done in the morning before I log on for work. And that's always worked really well for me to kind of give myself that like best creative energy mm -hmm. in the morning. And I think that helps me from feeling burnt out. Um, but yeah, the copywriting I would say is is very different, but I think it still really is helpful for me. I write product copy, so anything on the website, if you're looking at a jacket, like I would have written the description for it. Mm -hmm. And I try to keep everything between 
three to five sentences. Oh, okay. And it teaches you a lot about like how to write really concisely and how to keep yeah. people's interest, how to share the most critical information. And then, you know, a little bit of like more flowery mm -hmm. kind of parts of it. Um, and it's interesting, like sometimes editing flash fiction or, or nonfiction, um, I find that my copywriting work is very helpful for that, like yeah. how to tell a story in a hundred words, you know? Right, right. That's interesting. You're reminding me, I did a tiny bit of copywriting for like just freelance and I did some for this designer uh, denim brand. And so there's a the whole thing about turning a feature into a benefit, <laughs> right? Like a mm -hmm. turning mm -hmm. like some aspect of the product into something that's a benefit for um, the consumer. Right. So, mm -hmm. but fiction, obviously nonfiction is very different. So I'm wondering if you can maybe talk about that a little bit, like the other differences you see between those kinds of forms, right? Like your, the, the work that's published in your magazine, um, is intended to create a kind of experience in the reader, whereas the copywriting work is trying to get them to like buy, <laughs> to take an action, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are, in a way, you are trying to, but you're trying to inspire a feeling in the person that is reading the work. Um, again, whether the feeling is just purely an emotion or a feeling to be led to make a purchase, you know, mm -hmm. that is different. But um, within, they're different again, just in that, like there isn't a lot of room to be super creative, especially working at like a larger brand. There are just like a lot of rules that you need to be following. Um, so it's interesting kind of in the pieces that we get at Atlas and Alice. Again, a lot of our mission is about like breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. So it's really fun when people really lean into that. Yeah. And are you a nonfiction writer at six in the morning or fiction, poetry? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly nonfiction, a little bit of fiction here and there. I find writing fiction is um, almost like a nice break for me in a way. It's like nice, again, to write something that has no rules. I find nonfiction to be like very full of rules. You know, everything has to be fact-checked. You have to make right. sure you're being very fair to anyone who's being portrayed. Writing fiction, it's like free for all, anything goes, you know. <laughs> <That's> so, <interesting. laughs> so how do you talk about the different genres at the magazine if you're, um, do you like defer to the editor who sort of has the expertise in that genre or is it all equal, you know, everybody has equal say? Within um, Atlas and Alice, we, there isn't really any crossover with the other genres. We don't ever really work with the fiction um, editors and we don't really work with the poetry editors. So again, it's up to the writer really to designate what they think the piece falls within and we will follow their lead. Okay. Um, and is there anything specifically you're looking for more of in submissions? Any topics or styles or approaches? Yeah, that's interesting. I think I'm always looking for something that is speaking to current events in hmm. some way. We really don't get a lot of that. Um, I'd like to really read some like political work, honestly. I think that there's just so much going on in the world and I would love you know, this kind of like an interesting exploration, again, like some comparison politics to something else. I don't really read like a lot of fantasy myself, but I I read the Game of Thrones series. <laughs> and I think Game of Thrones is like the most amazing political allegory, like something like that, I think is, um, would be really interesting and, you know, much shorter form than mm -hmm. the Game of Thrones, you know, five story series, six story series, whatever <laughs> it is. Um, but yeah, something that's kind of reckoning with the larger world, I think we don't get like too much of. We get a lot of pieces that come from personal experience, which I love and are fantastic. But I would like to see a little bit more of an opening, I think. Do you get science fiction submissions? We will get science fiction submissions, but we that's not really... Depending on how science fiction it is, I don't know that we publish that much of that. Okay. Um, and so what should a writer do if they get a rejection from you? What should they know? Should they keep trying? Should they wait six months? How does that work? They're welcome to submit again next time we open. Um, we probably are not 
I don't know if we're ever really able to send out rejections while we're still accepting submissions in that same round anyway. Um, and if we are, we would ask them to not resubmit during that same round. But we're definitely open, you know, to new work from the same person. I think that I just ask that people, and I know that every magazine asks for this, but just to be familiar with the kind of work that we do publish, we get so many submissions that are like academic papers, very journalistic, you know, reporting papers. We get a lot of kind of like philosophical musings and things like that. We get thesis papers and that's just like not, we don't publish stuff like that. We never have. Um, and I think that that shows that the person is just completely unfamiliar with our magazine, hasn't ever read us before, is just shooting their piece out, you know, to anyone that's open for submissions. Um, so I would say if you have gotten a rejection, just making sure, again, that you have read through our magazine and that your writing does feel like a good fit. But no, I love seeing, you know, the same name twice. Mm -hmm. And do you have any specific advice for writers who specifically want to get published in your magazine? Like go back through your piece, make sure the connection between the different element, make sure the metaphor is very clear or, you know, whatever it is, like something very specific to your journal. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, I would just make sure that the language is really there, that there's like a strong voice. I think that's something that I'm always looking for. I don't want to read something that feels like it was written by AI or written by a robot. <laughs> I don't want to read something that feels like it's being read in like a theory voice or something like that. Like I want to feel like there was a person on the other side of it. Um, but things like spell check, grammar, I truly don't care. That's my job, you know, to fix stuff like that. So I would say don't be too worried about if there are like small little grammatical mistakes at all. Sure. Um, and is there a way for people to get involved with the magazine as readers or editors or can yeah. they? Yeah, we actually are looking for readers right yeah. now um, to start. <laughs> we are close for submissions right now, but we will be reopening in July. So we are looking for readers ahead of that next submissions period. Okay. So and the information should, someone... should be on our, Okay. yeah, it should be on our website. Um, Everyone also can find me on Twitter. It's just my name, Ariel McManus. And you can also feel free to ask me and I can put you in touch with um, whoever you need to be put in touch with. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so what is on the horizon for you guys? You just mentioned that uh, you're opening in July. Any contests coming up? Anything people should be aware of? Yeah, we are still publishing work from our last submissions round right now. So again, we have a nonfiction piece coming out within the next two to three weeks, I believe. And then we will be reopening in July. We don't normally do contests and we don't normally do themed submissions. Mm -hmm. We did do a themed submission round in kind of earlier in the pandemic, when, like during true lockdown. Um, and it was like a pandemic inspired issue. So every now and then we will do things like that, but I don't have a ton of visibility those are kind of in the middle of our normal submission rounds, which take place in January and July. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, following us on Twitter for any of those kind of interesting one-offs. Okay, well, that's good. So everyone can find you on Twitter. Everybody should go to the site, submit, get ready for July and find those intersecting elements and submit it to this magazine. So thank you very much for taking the time today. Yeah, thank you so much. This is awesome. <laughs>